Ladies and gentlemen, it, it is really great to introduce this panel. Uh, it's filled with a lot of friends, and uh, some of them are older friends than, than others, but uh, you have all their bios, and, and you can read the, the fabulous backgrounds that they have. But I did want to mention one thing about Mike Newton. <coughs> He's, now he's looking a little, oh, he doesn't no. know what I'm going to come out because we go back a long while. We went to Iraq one time, and uh, it was in connection with a, a program to teach Iraqi judges and defense counsel and prosecutors. And, you know, it was run by DOJ, and we got there, and I'm chatting with the DOJ guy, and I said, you know, because I prepared my presentations and everything, and and um, I said, you know, I'm really honored to be invited to be part of this. And he goes, well, well, General, you know, we, we're glad to have you here. Uh, we mainly want you just to make sure the Iraqis showed up and if there's a general that will show up. But the guy we really needed was Newton. <laughs> <laughs> but like I said, hey, that was out loud. I actually heard that, you know. The inner voice was audible. But our, uh, <clears throat> our panel moderator goes... We go back a long while. This is another view of our panel moderator when she was in the Air Force. Uh, and, and here's another view of her when she was in the Air Force. I knew that was coming. I knew that was coming. And uh, that was a little surprise when I was her supervisor. And um, we had a little exchange of views about, uh, where are you, Aaron? <laughs> anyway, she's now, uh, and this is the great, it's really great to see somebody uh, moved through their career because now she's chief of cyber law at the Central Intelligence Agency, and it's really a credit. And of course, uh, our other panelists are, I think, are well known to us. Uh, we, were, we were talking, and we were, of course, I always ruin her name. We were talking, she said she had a very provocative or very strong feeling. I'm thinking, if you've ever read her stuff, <laughs> strong feeling is like not an unusual uh, quality. And uh, Susan Hennessy, uh, if you read anything on the Law Fair blog, not the Law Fire blog, I always read her and Bobby Chesney because uh, you're always going to get a, a quality, not that the other isn't quality, but uh, I especially like her on her uh, podcast because she's trying to rate, rein in our, uh, from time to time, our mutual fan, friend uh, Ben Wittes, which is a full-time job. But... Uh, as I mentioned the other day, she has a posting, and anybody interested, I'll, I'll find it, about uh, service in government. And it really is, I think, uh, service in government in, in difficult times, shall we say. So I think it's very much worth reading. Without further ado, Erin. Great. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, sir. Um, so I'm joined by some incredible panelists here, and I think that if you look at their bios, you'll see a whole breadth of experience along, amongst government. Um, Mika is from the Third Way uh, and is spent a lot of her career on Capitol Hill, so she brings that perspective to this panel. Um, Mike is uh, from Vanderbilt and has a lot of experience with the International Criminal Court and international law in this area. Susan uh, used to be at NSA and is now a fellow with the Brookings in Institute. And of course, Bill, I don't think I need to introduce him, everybody knows him, uh, but a national security expert and in, in counterterrorism expert. And your former professor. And my former professor, Con <laughs> Law, first year. Students, be nice to your professors. Uh, last year, he moderated a panel that I sat on. So um, I just wanted to quickly introduce the topic. Uh, there are a lot of uh, changes in the technological environment that affect this topic, cyber and surveillance. Um, in 10 years' time, there will be 8.2 billion people in the world. And the largest markets will be China and India. The languages that are most prevalently spoken will be Chinese as first and Spanish as second. One in three of us will live past the age of 100. But this factor is really, I think, important, which is 50% of the jobs that exist today will no longer exist in 10 years' time. So our elementary students will no longer have the same job opportunities that they will have in, in uh, 10 years' time. 50% of those jobs will be diminished based on artificial intelligence, automation, and technological advances. So that's how quickly we're evolving in the technological environment. 
And that affects a lot of the things we're going to talk about here today in terms of law, uh, cyber, and surveillance. So with that, I'd like to start with Professor Banks and, and ask generally if you could provide a framework of where we are in terms of this, the uh, cyber and surveillance uh, and what type of legal challenges are we facing currently? As long as you have about three hours, I'll... Yeah. <laughs> You'll be pleased to see that I left my Syracuse hat back in the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yesterday in the, in the Civ Mill panel, we spoke briefly about uh, our English origins and the extent to which we reacted very strongly in the Declaration of Independence and then, of course, in framing the Constitution to uh, overreach by the Crown. That was in the area of Civ Mill and the tendencies there. Well, in the area we're talking about today, there's a there's parallel, because one of the one of the things that's most famous or infamous about the, the Brits uh, for many centuries and then in the colonies for a while was the use of something called the general warrant. The general warrant was issued by the crown, his subordinates at any time, to essentially ransack anyone's papers, possessions, home, place of work, personal effects for any reason or no reason at all, at any time, night or day, without authorization from any judge or any other government official. Our Fourth Amendment was a reaction to the general warrant. As you know, the Bill of Rights came after the framing in a way it was an afterthought, but it's a pretty important afterthought. So our Fourth Amendment protects all of us against that kind of overreaching. The problem in national security is that our history of uh, carefully regulating the, the use of investigative tools by law enforcement to enforce our criminal laws implicate essentially the same techniques and procedures that we use to investigate to protect our national security. The methods are about the same. But the, but the legal standards can't be, because we know that under the Fourth Amendment, all of us in the United States are protected against unreasonable searches and seizures, and in the normal course, if the criminal laws are being enforced, the police won't take a look at anything inside our homes, our persons, or our possessions without obtaining a warrant from a neutral <coughs> magistrate. As you, you all know, and you, or you can imagine with 30 seconds reflection, that kind of system is not practically valuable when we're trying to protect the nation against national security and terrorism threats. Intelligence investigations depend at the outset on secrecy. The warrant requirements and the rules for exercise of, uh, of criminal law enforcement under Rule 41 of the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure <coughs> have all kinds of things that would get in the way of an effective intelligence investigation. The target of such an investigation needs to be eventually served with a copy of the authorization. Uh, officers need to demonstrate a reason why that, uh, the warrant or the search cannot be executed in the daytime. Well, the list goes on. It would blow the whole operation. And as you know, criminal, traditional criminal investigations typically proceed from a completed criminal act, whereas intelligence investigations are trying to thwart something that hasn't happened yet, get out ahead. They're ongoing investigations. So there's been a real <laughs> challenge from the beginning at creating a legal framework for national security surveillance alongside the traditional criminal law framework. One other point of inflection, if you will, is that you also know, particularly in the last 20 years or so, that much national security law has become criminalized. There are criminal offenses now for hundreds of activities which involve the intersection of an intelligence investigation and a law enforcement investigation involving the same targets in the same situation. What do you do then? That gets into a discussion of something called the wall that we probably won't have today. We would need another three hours. 
essentially what happened in the United States, you know, throwing a lot of history under the bus, is that in 1978, Congress created a structure for the collection of foreign intelligence information inside the United States without going through the unwieldy, cumbersome, and, and transparent process of, of a criminal law investigation. It's called FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Many of you have heard that acronym. Only my mother knew about it until 9-11 and, and thereafter now. It's sort of a household word. She was a part of a small club. So FISA enabled investigators in the United States to secretly surveil electronically only in the beginning and eventually uh, added a provision for physical searches uh, in pursuit of foreign intelligence information inside the United States. The targets could be Americans or not Americans, but the key was that the government had to demonstrate instead of traditional criminal probable cause, probable cause to believe that a crime has been or is about to be committed, the new standard was probable cause to believe that the target is an agent of a foreign power or an international terrorist. Notice there, I didn't say anything about criminality because remember, we're not investigating now in pursuit of a completed criminal act, we're trying to stop something. We're trying to get out ahead. We're trying to monitor and assess. So FISA was a, a very artful uh, invention in the late 1970s to create a structure for our intelligence agencies to keep tabs inside the United States. Part of what happened in FISA was the creation of a new court. Now a lot of people know about this court. It's called the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, the FISC. It's an Article III court. The judges are Article III judges who've been sitting in a, in a district court uh, <clears throat> wherever they happen to be, and they're appointed for periods of years to serve on this special court. It's thought of to be a secret court because it's not one that you or I can walk into. The proceedings are conducted in camera. And historically then, the, the targets had to be approved by the special court. The attorney general would sign off on the, on the request for an order from the special court. The government almost always, more than 99% of the time, their applications for a, a permission to obtain surveillance in this method were approved. Through the 18, 1980s, 1990s, things were chugging along. We were getting up to about 2,000 or so of these applications in a year. Uh, but around the same time, I'm going to stop here so that, that others can, can pick up the thread. And at the same time, as you know, something came along called the Internet. And it dramatically changed the way communications, of course, are transmitted. It, it made our intelligence agencies' lives simultaneously much more difficult and much richer. There was a lot more stuff that came across our, uh, our infrastructure in the United States from outside the United States. So it had the unfortunate byproduct of bringing under the FISA umbrella a lot of surveillance activities that we traditionally conducted without resort to statutory authority, but the pre only on the basis of the president's constitutional authorities to conduct intelligence investigations outside the United States. Now a lot of those communications didn't remain outside the United States, they passed through. So to get them here, we had to follow the FISA process, whereas previously we might have done so on the basis of the president's authority and an executive order. The other thing that happened because of the internet is that our usual way of keeping tabs, that is knowing the location of the target that we wanted to investigate, suddenly became more complicated because any of you with a Gmail know you can work from your Gmail anywhere. So knowing that you had a target inside the United States suddenly became more challenging. There are ways to find out, human intelligence, you know, triangulating this source and that source, but it wasn't straightforward any longer. Why don't I pause right there? So there are criminal provisions of FISA and there are other <coughs> um, criminal laws that are implicated by surveillance. So Susan, I'd like to know, do you think that the laws go far enough in protecting the public and protecting, on the other side, national security? 
when it, as it pertains to surveillance. So again, that's a three or four hour question. Um, so I, I think it's important to understand um, uh, whenever we talk about FISA, there are, um, there's lots of different strains of public <laughs> information and it can get a little bit confusing. Um, so whenever we talk about Title I of FISA, um, this is, this is the, uh, broadly what Professor Banks was sort of speaking about, right? So an individual person uh, that you're, you're, you're making a showing for a warrant that's, uh, it's a slightly different standard than we see sort of in, in ordinary courts. Um, there's also the 702 debate that's going on. That's a different form of collection. Um, we also hear conversations about upstream collection. There, there's lots of different, um, uh, it's important to sort of keep those things uh, clear because it can, uh, it can get rather alarming for Americans, I think, to sort of, uh, uh, to confuse uh, uh, the various roles of, of the court and the law. Um, so broadly speaking, and, and this is uh, glossing over quite a bit of nuance, um, there are sort of two buckets in which intelligence agencies think about collection. Um, so one is collection that occurs outside the United States, and the other that is collection that occurs within the United States. So within the United States, that's governed by FISA. Um, there's court oversight, right? There's a special sort of bucket of procedures. Um, collection that occurs outside the United States is governed by what's known as Executive Order 12333. Um, so 12333 collection does have a number of, um, of really quite onerous constraints, um, but they are constraints that are, uh, uh, they're not discretionary to the executive branch, but they're constraints that the president himself could change because it's part of his constitutional authority. Um, so. Uh, the reason, uh, it, whenever we talk about FISA, um, we are, uh, whether we're talking about FISA or 12333, we're always talking about a foreign intelligence target. Um, and so whenever we talk about whether or not a U.S. person, so we're not, uh, the, the relevant divide is not between an American citizen or a non-American citizen, it's a U.S. person or a non-U.S. person, a definition that's broader than an American citizen, but includes all American citizens. Um, because of the way that uh, uh, the internet and telecommunications have changed, um, there are now lots and lots of conversations that transit through the United States. Um, and so for a number of reasons, stability, safety, uh, uh, the opportunity to, to uh, have particular types of collection, um, uh, there are advantages to collecting directly in the United States from a provider. Um, some of those collections is, uh, some of it is just uh, somebody outside the country speaking to somebody else outside the country. It just happens to come within the United States. Uh, that raises uh, particular concerns, right? Um, we are then conducting collection in an area in which there is a heightened risk of the United States government interacting with the private communications of a U.S. person. Um, so that is necessarily uh, uh, scary and problematic, right? We've, we've constructed, um, we, we fought a whole revolution over the issue, right? Um, one uh, uh, difficulty in, in mediating um, uh, is one, the lack of transparency, the lack of uh, the ability for ordinary people to, uh, to really understand exactly what decisions are being made. Um, the other issue is that this warrant model, by which we have warrants uh, setting forth with particularity and probable cause, it doesn't necessarily work uh, on an operate, in an operational, uh, uh, in a way that's responsible to operational needs within, the United, uh, within sort of the FISA structure. Uh, so we have this thing that is warrantless uh, collection, right? So you don't have a warrant. Um, that's not quite the same as saying that there's, uh, there's no oversight, right? There's, um, in, in 702, for example, there are certifications, right? So the challenge of our current law, uh, whenever we're talking about the FISA uh, space, is trying to incorporate as many of those protective features. So judicial oversight, congressional oversight, statutory constraints and trying to build in those substantive protections, the things that actually uh, protect the rights of US persons, um, and doing so in a way that is uh, operationally responsive to our security needs. So I don't, I, I'm not sure that I would say, you know, we've, we've hit the perfect balance, you know, everything is sort of, you know, it's great, let's keep going. Um, uh, one of the reasons we have sunset provisions that are written into the various uh, sections of FISA, right, so you need to recertify every couple of years, so section 702 is up for recertification at the end of this year, is because we have this need to have an ongoing <coughs> to refund, to say, okay, we made this choice, this, this slightly different balance than usual in this special needs circumstance. That worked for five years. Let's have another conversation. Has the technology changed? Has, has sort of the political landscape changed? Um, and, and so that's, uh, that's different than domestic law. That's an, that's an additional form of protection. So, I don't think, um, I think at any given time we might be more or less comfortable with, um, with where exactly we've struck the balance. Um, it's difficult. Uh, we certainly don't want to get to a place where we're frozen in time. Um, we want to continue to be responsive, you know, not just to uh, changing political perceptions, uh, 
uh, the, be responsive to the will, the will of the American people. Ultimately, they get to make the rules, even if uh, uh, these are uh, the rules are administered in secret, um, and also be responsive to a, a changing threat landscape. So, uh, piggybacking on that, and understanding how FISA enables um, electronic surveillance in the U.S. Um, and and elsewhere, uh, Mike, I'd like to know from you about the international community and the international community's view of our FISA law as well as their own sort of ability to um, to have their own equivalent or quasi-equivalent uh, laws for their own surveillance purposes. Okay, so this is a four-hour lecture. Um, <laughs> now, it's funny because Bill started with the Declaration of Independence, um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go there as well. Uh, people forget this. We, we tend to quote the Declaration of Independence. Remember the first clause. The first clause says, we feel compelled by decent respect for the opinions of mankind to state our reasons. And then he goes on to say, so international law, this integration, this communication with the rest of the world, I think is vitally important in this. And it's, it's been one of these essential strands of our democracy since the very beginning. By definition in this domain, we're talking about a global domain. And which point has been made over and over, and everybody knows that. Um, so what you get is this very complicated sort of four-box structure um, where you have relevant international norms. So when we're dealing with the Europeans, we're talking about the European Charter, the Article 8 of the Lisbon Charter. I mean, by definition, deals with privacy rights, as well as the, 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 the implementation mechanism within European countries. So because we're dealing with a global domain, it's complicated in that way, but as we've already said, as she correctly pointed out, we've got a very complicated U.S. domestic structure. You've got the Stored Communications Act, you've got FISA, you've got the various strands which Susan so nicely disaggregated, even within FISA, as well as our own international constraints. So in that four-by-four four box, what you get is a lot of complexity, okay? Now that's the professor part of me. Let me answer your question. <laughs> Which is what you're seeing is a remarkable convergence, despite all the hoopla and all the media, right? We share the same internet, and in the end of the day, we share a common problem, which is transnational terrorist acts, where money flows across borders, uh, ideology flows across borders, in a borderless shared domain, cyberspace. So what you've seen is, a lot of countries trying to grapple with the same problem in the same way that we've grappled with the right interface between, for example, the Fourth Amendment and Section 702, that, the, that, that shared concern between privacy, the proper scope of government, and at the same time enabling, enabling government appropriately and legally to fulfill its appropriate, proper national security, defensive, protective functions. That's the tension here. So that's the problem we have domestically. No surprise, our allies all have exactly the same problem. And so if, if, if I took time to chart for you, you know, for example, here's French surveillance law predating Charlie Hebdo. Here's the new French law post-dating Charlie Hebdo. What you see is this swing really towards Section 702. Same thing in Germany, same thing in Canada. And the UK, particularly the Investigative Powers Act, which just became law, okay, in 2016. Um, very similar to stuff we would be pretty comfortable with. So we say, okay, great, we're getting convergence. We're all tackling the same problem in roughly the same way. You know, we're attacking the metadata problem and the balance of, you know, who does oversight, Susan? Is it private? Is it public? Is it a court? Is it a warrant? What's the warrant requirement? So you're seeing in one level a remarkable convergence. And at the exact same time, the, ba the barriers that prevent real convergence and harmonization are actually being reinforced. So, and I just pulled this brand new case from the European Court of Justice, 21 December 2016, and I'll just read you the holding and let this sink in for a second. The court's answer is that EU law, now that international level of European Union law, as framed in both the Lisbon Charter, the European Court of Fundamental Freedoms, and the Europe ECHR jurisprudence, precludes national legislation that prescribes general and indiscriminate retention of data. Translation, no metadata ever. That's brand new European Court of Justice ruling saying across the European Union, you need convergence because you're all trying to tackle the same problem. The technology says we've all kind of come to the same place as a, as a matter of pragmatism. We're going to solve this problem in the same way. 
with appropriate balances between privacy and the rights of government, the European Court of Justice steps in and says, not so fast. European perspectives of privacy outweigh any of those domestic efforts. And before we're done on the panel, I want, to, I want to take some time to explain why that is. But that's the direct answer to your question. We're, we're moving towards convergence in the statutory schemes and in the way we think about the problem, but the fundamental barriers in the legal structures are, are, are in some ways hindering that. And in some ways, you know, the, you try to think, well, okay, what does that mean? Do we just throw up our hands and we say, well, this is just too hard. We can't solve this problem. I don't think that's the right answer. In the end of the day, if we don't get real convergence on a common problem in the global domain, really what we're doing is incentivizing extra legal action. Well, I don't think that's a good idea, right? So we've got to really grapple with the fundamental reasons why we have this problem. So it seems like the transitory and transnational nature of communication <clears throat> make this more challenging in terms of the international community as well as um, with U.S. law. I wonder about the commercial equities uh, associated with this, because when we're talking about 702 collection, we're talking about um, collection of communications of a foreigner overseas um, using US-based platforms. So Mika, could you please uh, explain to us a little bit about the commercial equities and, and their um, view towards uh, reform? Absolutely. Uh, so. As you all know, our communications infrastructure in the U.S. is owned and operated by commercial entities. We're not a nationalized communication structure like some other countries. So we're, all, we're talking about private sector companies who facilitate every communication that you have, landline, internet, the rest of it. It's not operated by the government. So the government can't just freely go into these systems and just take what it wants, with the exception of perhaps overseas, and we'll get to that with regard to U.S. companies. Um, so when you go back and looking at the history of FISA, one of the concerns that has always driven the U.S. government and the creation of these statutes are commercial equities. FISA started in large part because the Church Commission was doing an investigation of NSA programs and found one that showed that AT&T had been turning over all the telegrams in the United States to the government. Bulk collection in its earliest form. There was tremendous outrage of that. This was it was collection of people's innocent communications. FISA was enacted in large part to say, we don't do bulk collection of Americans' information. It is particularized. It is individual. The other advantage of FISA is that when the government goes to the company with a FISA warrant, that warrant comes with it liability protection. Because otherwise, absent that, it'd be a violation of the Wiretap Act. The companies could, in fact, be liable for Get giving those communications over. And in fact, the original FISA statute sets up liability penalties for companies that do not, that comply with government requests without a warrant. Fast forward to after 2001. The Bush administration, in the wake of the 9-11 attacks, went to the telecom companies and asked them to turn over massive amounts of information to the government absent FISA, not individualized warrants. We had too many communications that we were worried about. So both the telecommuni telecommunication companies, and I use that broadly because it includes internet service providers, turned over huge amounts of information secretly to the government. In 2006, the New York Times breaks the story of the, what was called the terror surveil surveillance program at the time, um, later revealed that that program was called Stellar Wind. When that program was revealed, the companies were facing liability in the billions because each communication, and you can imagine how many email communications there were, was a separate incidence of liability. People were filing lawsuits that would have bankrupted the companies. The courts had said, look, the program that you have now is not currently lawful. The FISC took a look at this and said, it's not OK. So the government had to come back to Congress and say, we need a law that allows us to do bulk collection, because this was collection that would have otherwise been foreign to foreign, not subject to the Constitution, but because it was taking place on U.S. soil from U.S. companies, some constitutional protections applied. So they came to Congress and said, we need a statute that will, again, give, allow us to give a court order to the companies so that they will comply and they will have liability protection. And this is what drove the entire conversation around Section 702. We were trying to capture, uh, I, full disclosure, I helped write the law, so flaws in it I, I, were due to our oversights. Um, 
that we're trying to capture two kinds of collection, foreign to foreign uh, communications that happen to transit the internet, right? Abu bad guy in Dubai emails, right, someone in Afghanistan. We're trying to collect that communication because it happens through internet uh, architecture to transit the US. The other thing was Abu bad guy in Yemen is emailing with person in the US and the FBI wants to know who is that person? We're targeting the foreign end, but we want to know what's going on on the US end. Those were the two big buckets. The foreign to foreign communications you'll often hear referred to as upstream, right? That was uh, taking information off of the communication pipes, a lot, large quantities of it with low levels of constitutional protection. And then what people refer to as PRISM, which are the foreign to US communications where the US communication is what we call incidentally collected. When we set up this statute, we were very concerned about what it meant, you know, we were trying to protect companies. Um, but one of the things that we didn't think about in writing that statute is now all of a sudden, US companies were subject to an order from the US government for their communication, for communications of foreign customers. And now all of a sudden, foreign customers could see that the US government had a right to demand those communications in a way that they never had before. Before this, it was secret. So yes, we were collecting and people sort of knew, but it's very different to be able to point to a statute that says, wait a minute, why is it the US government gets our communications? These are our, our nationals. Um, and so it's caused a tremendous amount of stress in allied relationships. And then when Edward Snowden put out the documents that he had taken with him to our adversaries, um, that the anxiety over the, com the kinds of communications that were being received by the US government went up, resulting in yet another decision from the European Court of Justice that said, we are very concerned that this violates European privacy laws. Um, and again, they, that decision endangers data sharing agreements between the US and the UK, which again makes the companies very nervous. So there are company equities in this, because what the US government can demand from them affects their relationship with foreign customers, and thus affects the competitiveness of US technology industry writ large. So I think we are at a moment now, again, where we have to think about what does it mean for company equities in the context of a surveillance statute, which most people don't think about, because our priority in a surveillance statute is often the national security of the United States, but it has these collateral impacts. You raise a very good point. You're talking about foreign customers. And earlier, Susan was talking about um, US persons, uh, that includes US citizens. There are protections in law for US persons. Um, how about foreign citizens? And do you believe there should be provisions that give the same protections to foreigners that they give to US persons? So Mike may be able to talk to this better than I can, but one of the things that I think foreigners overlook in, the, um, in our statutory scheme is there are tremendous amounts of oversight that exist. A court has to review the order to um, determine that it's lawful. The collection has to be in some kind of foreign, have some kind of foreign intelligence basis. There is internal oversight from the NSA IGs. There's external oversight because the United States has very robust <laughs> legislative oversight, a separate branch of government that's overseeing intelligence programs. Um, there is FISC oversight. When you compare the oversight that exists in this particular program to what happens in foreign governments with their surveillance oversight, US oversight is tremendously robust. Now that's for collection that takes place on US soil. For collection that takes place outside of US soil, say offshore in another country, the protections are not as robust. Um, but it does offer a lot of protections. Now, I don't know if those protections are sufficient in the eyes of our foreign allies to meet their sense of what would be necessary um, to protect them. Just, yeah. just to give a little bit. Um, there, uh, there's two sort of um, ways to think about it. So one is um, legitimate and lawful collection. Um, so that's actually getting the information. Um, and then there is what we do with the information once we have it collected. Um, so it's very difficult at that collection point. Um, no uh, emails don't say, hi, I'm a US person. I'm not a US person. Um, uh, we, we have to use some proxies there. Um, we know that there's going to be mistakes. We know that there's going to be incidental collection. Um, that's just sort of, that's a nature of the technology. And, and who knows, maybe one day there'll be some beautiful technology 
technological solution where we can put foreigners in one bucket and US persons in another and then you know, never the twain shall meet. Um, so uh, a lot of what we're talking about now with, with, the, with the FISA structure is really about how do, we, how do we make that collection lawful? How do we, um, how do we reduce the probability that we're accidentally getting something uh, we aren't? Wh where should the rules apply based on the different levels of risk, based on the types of the collection? Once the information is collected into the United States, right, so, so it's in a big database somewhere, um, there are a set of rules that apply. Um, and that set of rules is, is really uh, a very, very robust, complex structure. Um, uh, they're broadly known as minimization procedures. Um, so these minimization procedures, uh, they say uh, who can look at the information, uh, what information has to be purged, what can be retained, for how long. Um, whenever you see that you've, you've collected a piece of communication, uh, when can you open it up? Um, so there, there's lots and lots of protections. Um, so previously we had thought about those as being US persons got those protections and everybody else was kind of on their own, right? This, our laws are about protecting uh, the rights of US citizens, the constitutional rights of, of US persons. This is, you know, foreigners were on their own. Um, one of the, uh, the significant uh, changes that have occurred recently is the implementation of PPD 28, um, which, which extends certain rights to, uh, to innocent individuals abroad, right? Um, saying that, hey, if you're just someone who's having a regular conversation outside the United States, you know, we're going to, uh, to extend some additional protections to you as well. Um, that's discretionary. Uh, that might go away. Uh, we haven't, um, uh, this, the, the current administration hasn't uh, necessarily signaled where they fall on these issues. Um, there's also statutory elements of this. So there's not just a question of what can the United States do with, with your information. There's also a question of if you're a person who believes that the United States has done something wrong with your information, what are your rights? Uh, so a U.S. citizen, a U.S. person, you can sue the government, right? You, can, you, have, uh, you have redress. Uh, previously, foreign citizens didn't have redress. Um, so we passed something called the Judicial Redress Act, which gives uh, 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 the citizens of particular countries the right to actually address their grievances in court. So a lot of these developments actually are in response to exactly what uh, uh, Mika's talking about. This, um, these concerns that are coming, commercial concerns uh, from European companies. And remember, our companies are multinational companies, right? We think of Facebook as, as a United States company, but it's not. It's a global company that has to answer to lots of different sovereigns. Um, and so some of these uh, changes that are occurring in, in US law are also for commercial purposes to provide those kinds of reassurances so that multinational companies that speak to other countries um, uh, they can say, hey, look, we're not indiscriminately collecting all of your, all of your uh, innocent citizens' information. Um, we're applying these protections. They're more or less equivalent to the protections you apply. Um, and that really is uh, about not just recognizing that, you know, uh, we don't want to have innocent people's communications. They're not useful uh, for intelligence purposes, but also that there is some basic uh, privacy right that we want to uh, protect here. So, Mike, is that going far enough? For yeah. the international community? Yeah, I just say preach it, sister. Yeah. <laughs> I could just sit here and listen to these smart people talk. Um, no, I think I, there's a couple of observations I have. So the statistic I saw, and I don't know this is accurate, this is just what I read on the internet, um, <laughs> that that when they when they when they threw out the the Safe Harbor Act, when the European Court of Justice back in 2014 overruled the Conflict. Safe Harbor, How about, <clears throat> explain what Safe Harbor. Safe Harbor is the provisions between us and the Europeans um, governing the retention of data, and exactly the problem you're talking about. We're taking the same problem. We have the same standardized approach. You know, therefore, you know, Facebook Ireland can be confident in, in addressing its its own legal duties, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, particularly important for U.S. companies, you see, because they have all this proprietary information stored all around the world. So the number I saw was 4,500 U.S. companies affected. Now, what does that do to your business model? How are you going to do business in Europe? The minute that's thrown out, which then caused a, you know, really intensive effort. Um, so just the name change ought to be instructive to you. We went from safe harbor, which was overruled by the European Court of Justice, to something new, which just came into force last year called Privacy Shield. And just let that sink in for a second. Privacy Shield, right? And the point is, um, and I'll give you a, a lot of detail here, what we've actually done is gravitated to a very European view in terms of the common structure for the retention of data, for the sharing of data, for the transmission of that data across borders, which gets back to surveillance. Right? So if you can't lawfully use their mechanisms, my personal opinion, I don't, I'm not a government employee anymore, so I, as I, I can always speak in my personal opinion. My wife didn't even tell me to say this. Um, the Europeans largely didn't understand our statutory structure. 
they don't understand the minimization procedures that are built into FISA. They don't understand the, the detail, you know, Bill points out, yeah, 99 percent of warrants are approved. Why? Because it's so ridiculously complex to walk through the statute, as you practitioners know, and you got Article III judges sitting there looking at it. So we get very good within the DOJ of doing that, right? And we know what we do. We don't do it until it's right and it's lawful, and we've complied with the really rigorous structures within FISA. So Europeans look at that and say, ah, see, you've just got Article III judges rubber stamping stuff. They don't understand the, the complexity of the structure. So a couple of takeaways. One, that's led most of our European allies to try to look for some functional equivalent of that, rather than a FISA model of having a secret. That, that bugs them. It's secret. Well, duh. It has to be secret, because that's what we're, you know, hey, terrorist organization, we're after you now, right? And here's our warrant filed public with due process. No, you don't do that. And you don't have a probable cause standard. So yes, it's secret in that sense. But that should not be equated, as the Europeans have done, with subterfuge for just rubber stamping, doing whatever you want to do. That's, those are not synonymous, and the Europeans saw it in that way. Um, so, so what you've seen in Europe in these domestic structures is a real struggle to try to solve that problem. You've created some analogs, some, some quasi-judicial. The Brits have tried centralizing power in the Home Secretary's office. Um, the French have tried a different approach, which the Constitutional Court partially accepted and partially rejected. That, I think, is the fundamental problem that we have not solved internationally yet. How do we have an agreed-upon international oversight structure that does both things, ensures that the, the complex statutory and treaty-based mechanisms for protecting privacy are, in fact, met, that we're actually doing that, but also serves as a check on the unconstrained power of government? Um, and I don't want to drag on, but I want to explain why we still have that problem in a couple of minutes. So one of the underlying bases here that we're talking about is um, attribution, yeah. understanding the person, and as Susan said, uh, in email, somebody doesn't say, hi, I'm an American, um, it's hard to attribute nationality based on limited information, and mistakes can be made. Um, Professor Banks, with the attribution being a challenge, what are the legal implications associated with that? <laughs> well, it, it makes our job a lot harder, and, and it calls into question the, the sort of framework for electronic surveillance law, domestic law and international law, because it's all predicated upon knowing where the target is. We can't know now because we can't always attribute, <clears throat> or if we can attribute, we can't attribute in real time. The surveillance activities have to be quick in most cases. And the attribution, the technical means for attribution have improved greatly in the last decade or so. I'm not a technician, but I read and I understand we're a lot better at machine recognition and detection than we used to be. And sometimes knowing the machine will even get you to who's punching the, the keys on the machine, so to the operator but not always, and often attribution technically has to be joined with other forms of intelligence to get you confidence in the judgment that, yeah, the target is so-and-so who's located in, in X, Y, or Z. So it really calls into question that uh, framework for regulating based on location. Uh, all of us here have been talking about that framework and different, uh, different components of it here, here this morning. I think eventually this isn't going to happen this year in renewing the, the sunsetting provision of FISA, but eventually we're going to have to remake the scheme for surveillance. Roughly, one idea is to essentially concede defeat, collect everything and then impose strict controls on how the information is used, whether it's metadata or content. The other approach is to go back to something more like the wall that we used to enjoy between law enforcement and intelligence and have some kind of a judicial involvement in making individualized cases. That sounds really hard to me. Uh, one more contextual point. Uh, I think it was Susan who mentioned PPD-28. That's the Presidential <clears throat> Policy Directive. Many of you know these acronyms, but some of you don't. By, by definition, those are malleable. That was an Obama initiative post-Snowden, in part to make up for 
a lot of ill will that the Snowden uh, leaks uh, caused in Europe and elsewhere, surveillance on heads of state, that wasn't good, right? So uh, the president was trying to, to make, make good uh, and to establish protections for people around the world in 2014. It, it's wholly unclear whether President Trump will revoke or amend uh, the, the PPD or put something in its place that's entirely different. Hard to tell, hard to tell. And so that form of that aspect of our law is entirely malleable at the executive's discretion. And so much of our surveillance activities that continue to go on abroad, particularly uh, by Aaron's agency, are, con are being conducted pursuant to an executive order that dates from President Reagan in 1981. It's been revised several times, but it's still basically the core authority for the executive to work in, in uh, intelligence activities abroad. So just a sort of a, a quick note. Uh, yes, so both executive orders and PPDs ca uh, can be changed. It's not a law that Congress uh, changes. They are treated as binding law by the executive branch, right? So the president as a person could make those changes. Um, this has caused a lot of concern, right? A lot of people said, well, you know, executive order 12 triple three, we have a president who feels differently about a lot of things. You know, maybe he'll just come in. Um, uh, I think that that does um, highlight some of the tension between, you know, do we want additional statutory uh, authority, which by the way, some people read as authorizing activity, right? There's a way it's constraining, but it's also allowing something. Um, uh, that it's not uh, my my sort of the, the one point I, I always want to make whenever people get get nervous about twelve triple three sort of in the age of Trump or, or whatever comes next um, is that it's not yes it could be changed it's not as easy as a pen stroke right yes there is an executive order there are then DOD directives I mean there's sort of there's the entire um, the entire structure of the U.S. intelligence community is built on top of this thing. So to the extent that there are changes, it'll be visible. It's sort of it's it's a very complex structure. Um, you know, the other thing that I think it's in sort of important to uh, to have as the background whenever we think about how we're going to make these uh, these decisions about how to get to the right answer is that this is an area in which um, being late and right is as bad as being fast and wrong. Right? That the consequences here of taking your time to figure out the exact thing. Um, can be as significant as making the mistake early. And so that really is um, rather different than lots of other areas of domestic law. It's the reason why we think about these things differently. Um, it's not to say that they're, you know, these, these basic rights are not um, incredibly important, but I, I think that sort of that time element really is the driver for all kinds of, of compromises and concessions here. So one thing you mentioned is uh, with executive orders and presidential policy directives, they can be changed by the president pretty much with a flick of a pen, but there are other implications there. Mika, I'd like to know from your experience on Capitol Hill, while this is not legislation that, that the president could change so easily, there are um, there's the ability of Congress to put some pressure uh, on the executive branch to do certain things. Can you explain that? So yeah, I think one of the challenges for Congress in dealing with a lot of these executive orders is actually the operations that happen under executive orders in the intelligence space are only known by a very small group of people in Congress. Um, the House Intelligence and, and Senate Intelligence Committees are actually read in to the highest levels um, in most intelligence operations. And so they have a much better sense of what the capabilities are and what the constraints are on the US government when they, do, um, when they act in the <laughs> intelligence arena. Um, and so they have the ability to use budget pressures and oversight pressures and put things in their intelligence authorization bills that can constrain presidential action. Um, but one of the challenges for those committees is that they are always approaching things from the perspective of the intelligence committees or community. And that's their jurisdiction. And so they naturally think about things in this way, in the legal frames that the intelligence community thinks about things. Unfortunately, a lot of the laws that they pass have implications for other legal structures. So one of the things that was a challenge in Section 702 is that you created this intelligence database that was designed for intelligence agencies, national security agencies, to try and disrupt plots and foreign act intelligence activities before they went off in a preemptive way. But that database is also available to the FBI and to law enforcement, which is using that exact same information to prosecute cases that have already occurred. And the FBI, when it is in conducting a law enforcement investigation into an American citizen and into a crime that's taken place on US soil, is fully bound by the Fourth Amendment. 
So you have an, a pool of data that's collected without a warrant that is, in fact, bulk that the FBI can go into, and they can go into that without a warrant. So when we're talking about congressional reforms or reforms to the act and things that people are uncomfortable with, you have seen, at least in the House, over and over again, members of Congress passing legislation that says, we are uncomfortable that the FBI can search this vast intelligence database for U.S. person information without a warrant. And they call that backdoor searches, which is actually very confusing. Um, um, but that they, they want to say, if the FBI is going to search that database for your information, you got to get a warrant. The Constitution says get a warrant, get a warrant. Um, and so that's a real challenge. One of the other challenges that Congress is looking at in terms of its um, concerns about where the statute lies is that because the U.S. government and the president has so much authority to collect outside the United States under 12333, if you're a U.S. company and you're giving over your data under 702, you get the warrant, you turn over all this data, and you think, great, I know what my liability risk is here, that's fine, but your data is everywhere, and say the U.S. government, hypothetically speaking, is tapping into that data in some other cable running somewhere else um, overseas, and taking it, and you have no idea what's going on, 12333 collection can allow the U.S. government to collect things that aren't necessarily in that framework. And U.S. companies are very concerned that as U.S. persons, right, corporations are people too, U.S. companies acting overseas, they don't have the same protections and they can't make the same guarantees. One tech company, executive tech company said to me, look, if they're sneaking in and taking our information out of the back door, the warrant at the front door makes up uh, right? It makes a mockery of the warrant at the front door. How can you knock at the door and give me a warrant and take my data at the same time you're sneaking around the back and stealing it all outside the U.S.? So you have a lot of companies who are very concerned about this, this, um, this loophole in the, the legal framework. And so there are people in Congress who are thinking about how do you deal with that? Um, and so Congress can put pressure on the executive, sometimes even just by introducing legislation and saying this is a problem. They can get the executive to make changes to the way that it operates to try and foreclose a legal change. So just to um, sort of put on my former NSA hat, you know, 12333, I, I don't know that um, I would categorize that as a legal loophole. Um, it's the separation of powers under the Constitution. Um, we have vested our commander with uh, particular authorities, right? We actually, we made very intentional choices about what was going to be the purview of the legislative branch and what was going to be uh, a sort of the, the scope of executive power. Um, and that's uh, a really important uh, sort of protection uh, in, in the United States. That's that's part of our balancing. That's part of um, that's part of this sort of this core constitutional notion. And so whenever we talk about seven, twelve triple three as sort of this this loophole or something that um, you know that, that really needs to be reined in, um, it's. Uh, we are talking about uh, the executive branch and, and the executive acting in their constitutional capacity. Um, now, there are lots and lots of protections for U.S. persons' information under 12333. Um, those are uh, uh, quasi-discretionary, right? I mean, they, they, they could theoretically be changed. Um, uh, so that's not to say that this is a free-for-all and you can just get information uh, abroad. You aren't allowed to target a U.S. person. There's, uh, there's protections that look quite similar to what it looks like in the FISA structure. But whenever we start talking about bringing Congress in to start regulating that activity, we start to get into really, really complex questions of whether or not Congress would then be exceeding their constitutional authority here. Um, and so that's just, that's the, uh, uh, that's one of the tension points. And as we see sort of the pendulum swing in terms of um, either security interests or, or privacy interests, that, um, that, that proper separation of powers is, is an, I think, an animating concern throughout. So no, to get that I agree, but I also disagree. Because, go ahead. I was going to say, just to the question of separation of powers, it's clear from the 702 statute itself that the Congress has the constitutional ability to regulate the, the conduct of the executive with regard to U.S. persons, meaning U.S. corporations, acting abroad. So there is jurisdiction to do that. But one of the challenges on 12333, when we talk about the president acting in his constitutional authority overseas, is that we have had numerous executive branch officials saying, we have all these wonderful protections in the Constitution, and the Constitution stops at the water's edge. So it is a real problem when we are talking to our foreign partners to say, we protect your privacy and we care about it. But our protections stop at the water's edge. We have the ability, the president has broad discretion, 
and in many cases, intelligence activities can violate the laws of the country in which they're taking place and can be authorized by the president to do so. So there's this real tension in the ways in which we talk about privacy on the one hand and talk about the powers of the executive on the other. And it is very confusing for people in the international arena to understand what we mean by protections in, in the context of what we mean by powers. Amen. I'm going to take the law student. She said what I was going to say. Um, <laughs> I hear that all the time. I'm like, then why bother? Um, no, I, I, I agree, but I also disagree, because 12333 is, is dealing with the allocation of authorities within the executive branch. And it's saying, you know, Army, you can do this. If you want to do that, you got to go to here as a matter of executive prerogative. But it's doing that against the backdrop of these statutory structures, which are, in fact, complicated. We have this hodgepodge of statutes. I mean, this, the, 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 the Stored Communications Act predated the Internet. Let's be clear. And yet it was the basis of the decision when Microsoft in the Second Circuit says, hey, do we have to give up the stuff stored on the Irish server? Second Circuit in 2016 says, nope. Statute's clear on its face, no extraterritorial application. So that's the problem, is this interconnection of statutory authority. And, and with the indulgence of my friends here, I want to take a couple of seconds and explain why this is such a problem between us and the rest of the world. The reason is because in FISA, and in 1233, and in, you know, all of us sort of resonant in our thinking, and I bet, if, I bet if we did a multiple choice test, this is common sense. We think of this in terms of balancing, right? That's what we're doing. We're, we're balancing. FISA says that explicitly, right? It's a, it's a totality of the circumstances test. You're balancing legitimate government security against legitimate constitutionally protected privacy and the data protection of civilians, et cetera, et cetera. That's common sense except in Europe. Because in Europe, when you approach things through the lens of human rights, okay, the human rights lens is a restrictive lens. So in a, a whole bunch of human rights cases in Europe, and the reason it's a human rights issue is because in, in the European human rights structure and in the Lisbon Charter, it specifically says um, that everyone has the right to the protection of the personal data concerning them. So it's framed as a human rights issue up front. So then you ask the logical question, well, when we're talking about this very important issue in a global domain where we're all affected by this conduct, shouldn't there be such balancing? European Court of Human Rights unanimously over and over and over again says, nope, no balancing in the human rights domain. You know, no artificial, you know, the UK government can't just come in and say, as we might in a 702 hearing, trust us, the totality of the circumstances in this circumstance on these facts the governmental national security interest outweighs the private, no balancing. It's a flat, bright line, no balancing rule. So it operates in a restrictive way based on the privacy and the human rights protections, which then puts the burden back on the government to produce an explicit, textual, affirmative authorization. So you either have to have a very specific derogation or you're back to the old world. You know, Bill mentioned the old wall between intelligence and law enforcement. We learned that lesson in 9-11. That's one of the problems our allies are all grappling with, right? Because in a law enforcement regime, balancing those human rights issues is pretty easy. That's what we do. We get warrants, we operate, but, but it's all retrospective. And it's based on probable cause. And it doesn't work in the real world when we're talking about Cyber, cyber conflicts, or on the flip side, surveillance. So that's the fundamental problem, is that the Europeans approach this problem from diametrically opposed perspectives. That's why when the Brits thought they had done a good thing by passing the new Investigative Powers Act, great, it solves a lot of these problems. One of the things the Investigative Powers Act does, for example, is break down, just like we had to do, the, the sharp dividing wall between intelligence and law enforcement says there may be some circumstances where you can share the same database for a very different purpose, and when you do it, here's a statutory structure for oversight and minimization and all of that stuff. I can guarantee you that has zero future when it gets to the European Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights. If that's the fundamental problem here. We've just got a diametrically opposed uh, approach to the problem. Uh, you know, to complement that, I think there's another aspect in which our systems is so different from all the European systems, it's called separation of powers. They are parliamentary systems and they, they don't get it. They say, well, why don't you just tell your government, government being an inclusive term, to go out and change the policy. Well, it doesn't work that way here. 
we yeah. have to work with the sort of messy uh, landscape that we have of multiple statutory authorities that overlap and executive authorities that complement but sometimes come up short. Yeah, and let me just give a two-finger, one-second example of that. So the 21 December 2016 decision from the European Court of Justice um, that said you can't have any domestic statutory construct structures that allow what we would do in 702 uh, was started by the Swedish telecommunications company. See, so this, what we think of as separation of powers and sort of thing, very different in their context. That's a Swedish telecommunications company that brought that case after the safe harbor provisions were thrown out. They said, all right, now what do we do? Because we're part government, we're part private, we've got a store, what do we do? And that's where that decision came from. So, Mike, you mentioned the Stored Communications Act and that that is the basis for the Ireland case. Um, the, the law in the area of, in this area is, uh, in my opinion, arcane, to say the least. Where do you think are, and this is open to any of the panelists, where do you think are the gaps in the law that need to be filled, and do you think with the new administration you'll see those fills done? I think it'll come from, the, I mean, it's it's a change in law, so it'll be whether or not there's the legislative branch. Um, ECPA reform, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, is sort of is a big uh, issue right now. Um, there are lots of parts of ECPA that uh, both pose simultaneously, make things really hard for the government, and make privacy people really uh, angry. So it's sort How about of, a thumbnail on what ECPA is? Right, so um, this is the, uh, the provision that governs uh, uh, how both individual providers have to treat information in, in their custody and, and how the United States can interact with that data. Um, and so ECPA is sort of the big, uh, the big question. It's, um, uh, there's been different forms of ECPA reform uh, bills have been uh, introduced in the last several uh, uh, Congresses. Um, the House actually passed one almost unanimously last year. They've done so again this year. The holdup is sort of the Senate. Um, it's an area in which the broad strokes of reform, I think there's actually large bipartisan uh, support for. Then whenever you actually get into the details of what the various things look like, there's, it's so complex that it's just about sort of not being able to find the solution. You know, Mika might have a better sense of whether this will be the year that Congress mm -hmm. pulls yeah. together. Yeah, I mean, I think the real problem with that ECPA, um, the, the Congress is trying to fix with ECPA, is the idea that um, your emails that are less than 180 days old, the government has to get a warrant for, and the emails that are 181 days old or older, they only need a subpoena, so they don't have to go to a judge, and they get that from the provider. So there's a sort of like, wait, why is it that an email past a certain age is entitled to a different level of privacy than one that is of a different age? So they're trying to rationalize, because, you know, your emails, if you're like me, and you just keep everything in your email, and it goes back like five years, and there's like 5,000 emails in your inbox, Maybe that's a little bit too much information. Um, like, like you have you have stuff that's sitting there that's like you know really old, and so right. Why should the government read the emails between me and my dad about we were getting my mom for Christmas one year versus like having to get a warrant for a different year? Um, but there are administrative agencies that want to be able to just get a subpoena, like the SEC. And so there's some tension there, and we don't want to have to change how we've done it in the past versus can we rationalize privacy protections across a wide range of things. Um, but at, since that's the vehicle that is moving, all these other things like the Stored Communication Act, extraterritoriality, and um, how the MLAT reform and how the U.S. government and other governments get information on people in various jurisdictions by serving US companies that are operating everywhere. Like there are all these sort of questions of how in the context of a court case, so this is backward looking, you get electronic communications and so it becomes very complicated and it's sort of like a, right, trying to put too many people on a raft. Like it can hold a few, reform can hold a few things, but if you try and put too many things on it, it'll just sink and, and not move anywhere. There's also there's there's also a non uh, non surveillance security aspect, which is that companies need to protect their own systems, and then that includes monitoring those systems. And so there's actually um, uh, basic cybersecurity practices that United States companies are not positive they can discharge legally, even though they're sort of common sense uh, uh, monitoring. And so that's another. There's also a part of sort of ECPA reform that's really just about pure cybersecurity that has very little to do with the government. I'm just trying to decide if I want to name my dog ECPA or not. <laughs> no, I always say the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. You know, the other problem here is, um, the other problem is that you've got federal courts 
applying the existing statutory framework, which is complex in its own right. I think the word is internecine. It's just, just arcane was your word. Um, but in fact, ordering under U.S. federal law, or ask, ordering companies by judicial decree to do stuff that is illegal overseas. So what do you do with that? And I think that's one of the big problems is try to get some harmonization. I've already alluded that we have a, a lack of harmonization in terms of the way we approach the problem. So you imagine we have this complex structure U.S. domestically. We also have a lack of harmonization with overseas structures. So that, if I were going to fix the world, I would say, right, we've got something, you know, that affects the MLATs, for example, the Mutual Legal Assistance Treaties, so that U.S. companies aren't in that bind, right? I'm trying to comply with my statutory authorities. I'm trying to do what the judge tells me to do. But if I go do what I've been told to do, I, I now have an, a, a larger problem legally in that other domain. Right. That's a big problem. And related to that, I mean, how many people in this room think that Congress is actually capable of producing a coherent legislative <laughs> scheme for dealing with the complexity of, like, multiple legal jurisdictions and sharing information across technology that many of them don't really know how to use? I mean, we have a real problem here. <laughs> So the, the group of governmental experts is an international body. They meet um, annually to discuss certain things, and including the last few years have been discussion of cyber norms for an international community um, to sort of their voluntary non-binding cyber norms to regulate behavior in cyberspace. And, and parties to this GGE include um, U.S., of course, Russia, and China, and others. So anyone on the panel, what do you think about the ability of us as an international community to come up with cyber norms that can be effective and actually be um, abided by by other nation states? I think we learned yesterday from John Carlin when he talked about the Russia case, and I pressed him a little bit at the end on the <laughs> delay. You all remember, you know, so Russia at the DNC last spring, summer, widely reported in July, uh, attributed by at least two intelligence agencies in the United States in October, and we didn't respond until December 29, and then we responded. It, it, the euphemism is too little, too late. Uh, you know, sanctions and, and related things that were in international law are called retortion. So one of the reasons that we uh, sort of limped uh, to the end of that episode, maybe it's not over yet, is that there was no norm. Uh, and and one of the, I think what Carlin said, and, uh, and I agree with him, is that the United States has to articulate that norm, and others will follow. International law can only develop in this area. It's customary law, right? It's not treaty law. It's customary law, so it's through state practice. States have to articulate their views for there to be state practice, and then Perhaps there'll be judicial decisions to uh, cement uh, that into a principle of international law. And typically, the, those developments take a long time. That's part of the problem here. There's an urgency in so many areas of cyber. And, and shading back to the last question, there's urgency in surveillance as well. Hell no, Congress isn't going to make a comprehensive, <laughs> coherent piece or structure for intelligence collection in the United States. And, and we're not doing it about attribution in the area of cyber either, but we can take steps like making public pronouncements about our view on interfering with a, with a democratic election, for example, and what consequences an actor will face if they do that again. That may make a difference, and I think Carlin was right there. Perhaps it should have been put out there sooner. It would have had more impact if it had been done in October or September or August when we pretty much knew what was going on. <coughs> but as I said a few moments ago, you know, to the credit of our intelligence community, we had to be sure. It, we knew this, these were Russian hackers, but we weren't sure in the beginning, apparently, uh, how high up the government that responsibility uh, when it, it turns out it went clear to the top, and we knew that by October. So we should have done something in October. That, you know, there are reasons that that we didn't, I guess. But getting that policy out there would make a difference, and that's just an example. We could do that in many, many ways. Back to surveillance for a minute. 
I have no confidence to, that the Congress will do anything <coughs> comprehensive or coherent. They are probably going to renew this so-called 702 program this year because they have to. It sunsets at the end of the year. There are all kinds of thoughtful proposals to make it a little better. I have one. I wrote. Uh, yeah. There are some copies. I put it's it on good. the table. Also. It's very good. good. There aren't copies for everyone. So. Yeah. The, Sorry. The, you know, the betting line on that at the moment is, is uh, you know, you got long <laughs> odds. Yeah. One way or another, that'll happen, but we're not going to get comprehensive <coughs> legislative reform anytime soon. So it's up to the executive. Yeah. It's up to the executive to, to make it better. And, and, you know, the agencies, the intelligence community have done a marvelous job in, in the years since 9-11 at look, there's not been another 9-11. There's been nothing terrible like that happened inside the United States, thanks to those people. It's the, it's the, it's the skill, ingenuity, and foresight of, of many intelligence professionals and their managers that have made that, made us safer by virtue of the work that they're doing in the intelligence community. And they can construct processes to make the system more coherent. As I said before, I think one of the one of the approaches, I never thought I would say this years ago, uh, is to basically concede that the government collects everything anyway. You heard our dinner speaker last night. What, how much of our stuff is in private hands? What do we give to Facebook, Google, our bank, our ISP? They got our stuff anyway. And maybe the better approach is to focus on use. Pay attention to what they do with it once they've got it and impose strict controls. I think one of the challenges with establishing norms in this space, too, is that um, the things that we get upset about that people do to us are also things that we don't like to talk about that we would also like to be able to do or are doing to other people, mm -hmm. right? So for all of the people in the room who got the SF-86 notice that OPM had been breached, right? Clapper said at one point, if we could do the same to the Chinese, we would love to be able to, right? There's a certain amount of, in the espionage surveillance arena, we don't like to talk about what norms are and what we say and what we put on the books may not, as prohibited, may not be the same as what we are actually doing in a clandestine or covert way against our adversaries for very good reasons. And I am really impressed and proud of the work that is done in that arena. But it makes it very hard to set norms when you say, look, I have the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, and you can't come into my computer systems. Oh, by the way, if I can hack the FSB, I'm going to, and you should. Um, but that, that's a tension in norm setting when stated, when stated um, principles are not the same as actual actions. And so it's hard to set up a, an inter international um, agreement about these things when we don't do that and then so neither do they. So the Chinese will say, oh, yeah, sure, now we won't hack your companies either. But will they? I mean, I don't, you saw s people say there's been a slight drop off, but I don't think it's going to go to zero. Mm -hmm. So norm setting in the Serena is very hard. So, yeah, uh, and there's uh, another problem here, though which is vocabulary. I mean, no pun intended. We actually speak a different language, right? So I, I had to laugh, um, and it's true, this is a recurring issue. We talk about norm setting. We talk about trying to have commonality with our allies and with our friends. Um, in, the, in the wake of the Sony hacks, and it's the same issue that we saw in the wake, I agree with Bill completely, we got to be decisive about what is the standard, what's permissible, what's impermissible, and we got to be clear talking to allies and enemies about what those boundaries are. That's how we establish norms. Well, that's not what we do, because that would be the adult, mature thing to do. What we do is we talk in vague generalities. So after Sony, the White House press, press uh, spokes puppet stands up and he says, you know, we're going to respond in an appropriate and proportionate way. And everybody shakes their head wisely and says, wonderful, as if they understand what that means. <laughs> Wrong. Because when the Europeans hear that, to be clear, they're thinking human rights proportionality, which means restrictive, only what's most narrowly tailored, only what's absolutely required. Now try to take that same logic, only what's most narrowly tailored, only what's strictly required by the necessities of the circumstances, where the government bears the burden of proof for each and everything that you do. When we talk about that kind of you know, human rights-based symmetry, it's use ad bellum symmetry, in essence. What we're really saying is there's a perfect fit between what we want to do and the harm we're trying to protect, prevent. Now, 
Well, that's the way the Europeans, the rest of the world, understand that term. That's not what we're talking about at all. And so we're speaking the same, we're saying them, we're mouthing the words without a real clear understanding of the normative power of what we're actually saying. And we're not even having those discussions, I hate to say. Yeah, so I, sort of going back to the, the, the norms questions, um, I, there's a little bit of naivete whenever we hear um, the United States talk about norms and talk about setting the norms, right? As if we're going to set the rules and then everybody else is just going to fall in line. Right. There are other relevant actors here um, uh, that have really, really different conceptions about the internet, about sovereignty. We hear the Chinese talking about uh, sovereignty in cyberspace. The Russians are sort of uh, are using similar language. Um, uh, we may agree or disagree. There are relevant actors that get a say in this conversation, right? Because norms are fundamentally about sort of this sense of agreement. Um, <laughs> In essence, the, the norms here are about line drawing, right? Um, where are we going to draw the line, uh, and how are we going to back it up? Um, and one of the things that I think we've seen play out over the past several years is one, um, we aren't so sure where we want our lines to be drawn, right? So we talked about um, uh, you know, the, the OPM stuff, right? So, so espionage actually is uh, permissible in, under sort of uh, norms and in, in international law, right? Um, the intelligence community sometimes says, um, if it was legal in the country where we were doing it, we would send the State Department, right? You can violate the laws of other countries. That's part of, uh, 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 that's accepted practice in international law. Uh, the difference is, so, so okay, uh, you can go and, and spy, for example, on, on a presidential campaign, right? That's kind of relatively routine activity among nation states. What about stealing the emails and releasing them? What about stealing the emails and releasing them for a particular purpose, right? And now all of a sudden, are you, have you crossed a line? Are you doing something to sort of uh, threaten our basic sense of, uh, uh, of legitimacy, right? And, and, and have you, uh, right, so uh, okay, you can go and look at, um, at the, at the uh, uh, military aircraft uh, plans, right? That's something that all nation states would be interested in, right? What if you're stealing it and then you give it to your commercial sector for, uh, for uh, economic purposes, right? Is that the line? So once we, um, we're having a hard enough time even drawing the line, let alone getting other people to agree that those are the appropriate lines, the real challenge is once our lines are crossed, uh, we don't know how we want to respond, what exactly the, the consequences are going to be. And so we're in this space in which the rules are really unclear, the consequences to those rules are really mm -hmm. unclear, Maybe we'll respond to OPM, maybe we won't, right? So there was uh, news reports that initially there was a decision not to respond, then they decided, no, 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 they did have to respond because it was so serious, and then, oh, never mind, uh, sort of roughly contemporaneous with when we signed the, the Xi Jinping agreement, we decided not to respond. And so just this lack of clarity in this space, paired with the really, really significant consequences, it's, I think it sort of leaves the norm question in, uh, we're, we're going to have to get, um, uh, serious about sort of our deterrence policy um, because it just takes too long for sort of these harmonizing norms to emerge in this space. I think that's a really great um, summary statement there, Susan. And I think I'd like to have an opportunity to open it up for questions in our last 13 minutes. A few hands coming up. Uh, Bob. <coughs> uh, Bob Turner from the UVA Center for National Security Law. I probably worked on FISA as long as anyone in the room since I worked on it as a Senate staffer in 1978 when it was passed, and indeed told my senator it was clearly unconstitutional, as did the FISA Court of Review unanimously in in Seal case, but, uh, and also it kept us from preventing 911 by blocking us from uh, surveilling Massawi, uh, but that's, that's another issue. But the difference between the approval of FISA warrants and Title III criminal warrants is 0 0.001 percent. Uh, you know, people don't submit warrants unless they're pretty clear they're going to get approved. Uh, but my question for you is, can you name any warrant court that does not meet in secret? That's this big complaint, oh, it meets in secret. Every warrant court meets in secret. Otherwise, you know, the mafia would have their guy sitting in court say, oh, Guido, they're going to look at you next week. Don't, don't talk on your phone. It's, it's absurd. So I can't because there isn't one, um, which I think may be your point. I, I think that's, that is a, a really important point, right, that the, this um, uh, secrecy is part of, of sort of security in, in lots of different contexts. Um, the question is, uh, 
uh, what other forms of transparency can we use to uh, allow uh, sort of the, the American people to make a basic uh, assessment about what's going on, right? So how can we um, get that kind of process transparency so they really understand how these decisions are being made, even where the factual details can't be brought to the public? Um, I think everybody recognizes, or sort of most reasonable people recognize the need for, for some sort of basic nucleus of secrecy. It's, I think the real place for improvement potentially is we could do a lot better on sort of on communicating how the process works, what the standards are, the, the sort of the general rules. Um, and, and that's a place in which the government has just failed to adequately communicate with the public. Yeah, and then and law students, if you're looking for a paper, uh, Bob Turner, I call him Tiny Turner. He's a giant man. Um, Tiny raises a great point because this, this struggle between privacy and process-based oversight that Susan just mentioned is the same struggle that we've had with all of our allies. The Brits have addressed this, the Canadians have addressed this, the Germans have addressed it, the Australians have addressed it, the, the Germans have addressed it. I said the Germans. Who did I leave out? Oh, the Australians, the Germans, the French, the Canadians in the new Canadian bill last, last year. And the point is, Bob, they've all kind of come up with different process space. We're going to have a human rights ombudsman. No, we're going to have the representative of the home office. There are a great law student paper to try to address which one really does process space procedurally come close to, to solving that problem uh, in a way, and maybe that's norm setting, <coughs> right? When we really do kind of come to us, ah, here's a pretty good solution that works in practices that I use the word balancing, even though the human rights advocates wouldn't like that that does balance all these competing concerns accurately, then we communicate that to our allies and say, now we got something here. Let's work on this basis. And if I do this, will you uphold that, even in your own domestic structures? Right. One of the important things to remember about the role of the FISA court is that it, it's very different with respect to this programmatic or bulk collection than it is with regard to individual applications. Bob's absolutely right about the individual uh, applications, but so much of our surveillance in the last 15 years has been programmatic bulk collection where the court's role is to take a look in advance at the kinds of categories that the government wants to collect, take a look after the fact at how did the government do. It's more of a management administrative role instead of a judicial role so that Things, the questions we have to ask about what the court is doing are different with respect to these programs than with regard to the individual cases. Just one sort of quick two-finger. Uh, another challenge with the secrecy in, in sort of the FISA context is ordinarily in other places we rely on the adversarial process to represent the interests, right? So um, even if there are particular, you know, in-camera proceedings, um, uh, we try and, uh, we, you know, we say both sides can sort of fight it out in front of the judge to help the judge make the decision. One of the challenges in the FISC is um, it's just the government, right? And so, and so, ensuring finding ways to ensure that um, that judges are thinking about both uh, both issues. So now we have a fisk amicus, uh, uh, um, you know, sort of process. There, there, are, there are lots of ideas there, but that's it's another area in which this is just is a little bit different from the other context. And I would say this in the 702 context, one of the challenges is even though the government is supposed to present the 702 evidence if it's used with a particular defendant, the government has been inconsistent about disclosing the use of 702 evidence in cases. So for an individual whose liberty is at stake, they aren't able to challenge the constitutionality of 702 if they don't know that it has been used against them. So there's some real question. If you compare the number of cases that the government says, we have disrupted or have been successes for us because of 702 to tout the, the effectiveness of the program with the number of cases where 702 has been disclosed to a defendant, those numbers are not the same. So there's a real question. There's some cases pending challenging the right. constitutionality on right. that basis now. But just to be sort of uh, disciplined about the discussion before lawyers, uh, the, uh, FISA, the 702 statute does require notification. That is part of the law. Um, there is a question that, um, that existed and has actually been resolved at DOJ about whether or not derivative use, right, so you're not actually taking information you collected and then presenting it in court, but it started an investigation, whether or not that triggers the notification procedure. For a limited period of time, DOJ had, had determined that it didn't. Uh, they then, uh, with uh, upon counsel of the Solicitor General's office, decided that, that they had a better uh, interpretation of that, and now they are doing notifications. So it's it's a it's an important uh, this Although is an important issue, but a pretty. Yeah. I, you know, I saw a few other hands up. So well, uh, we we have a couple of questions from the overflow room, <coughs> but one 
quick two finger question going. Let, let Aaron read the question. <laughs> You're losing it there, man. Um, for, uh, for Susan, on the amicus, it, it, for the FISA court, I often wonder who really are they representing? Are, are they supposed to put themselves in a position where they represent what they think the people of the United States want, or whether their individual view of what the law should be? I, any thoughts on that? So this is an area in which I wish um, more people understood actually how the how the FISA courts work and how the FISC works, right? So a lot of people like the notion of particular amicus, and they see somebody who's their ideological proxy, and so they think, oh, okay, great, that's that person sort of speaks for me. Um, actually, the nitty gritty of the way the process works, um, the, the FISC has these staff attorneys, um, and these staff attorneys actually operate sort of as quasi, in the quasi-adversarial role. They sit there with judge, they're very, very experienced, usually former DOJ attorneys, and they are the ones that really are challenging the government to, well, you said this, but how does that meet this certification? And so the, the practice actually is really very rigorous. There are these people that play this really significant role, but we haven't done a good enough job in sort of explaining how that process actually works, what it looks like to people on the outside. I, I think that's a great point. And if you ever talk to the DOJ attorneys who are trying to prepare it for the, for the FISC, sometimes there's a little tension between the FISC. Because, and that's a good thing. <clears throat> so let me um, ask some of these questions that were provided. Um, from Sarah Williamson at Duke Law. Could you discuss the constitutional and statutory implications for the collection of passwords at the border? What is the impact of this policy on norm setting, even if provisions of the password is optional? So this is obviously a live question. Um, uh, it's a relatively complex one. Um, uh, there is broad authority um, under the Immigration and Naturalization Act for the executive to do lots and lots of things at the border. Um, uh, this question of whether or not um, collecting pa passwords uh, passes muster is an open one. Um, I think the more uh, the more significant objection is um, is whether or not that actually makes sense um, from an operational standpoint. Um, so this notion of we're going to collect it all, collect everyone's social media, that's um, whenever you talk to the people who are tasked with finding the needles in the haystack, actually identifying threats. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure that from an operational standpoint that's the best way to go about it. Obviously, there are um, uh, international reputational issues, not to mention some potential constitutional questions. So I think at this point, it's really a question of whether or not that's um, prudentially the right thing to do. Uh, if, it, if that actually ends up being the policy, I um, would anticipate the courts will eventually decide because it'll, it'll absolutely be challenged. So um, next question here is from Jennifer Pierce, retired civilian. With the use of artificial intelligence being developed and used um, in corporations and perhaps in government, are there statutes or laws being implemented to cover that type of surveillance? And is artificial intelligence being used in other countries for surveillance yet? Mike? Any? I was to say, the short answer to the first part of that is no. There, there aren't statutes to deal with this? And the long answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> Although, like, on the AI issue, I mean, there's a related problem that really has been bugging me lately. And it's one of these, if you're a technician here who knows how to help us figure this out, let's talk, because I don't know. Um, but it's, it's the AI, you know, when you really understand what artificial intelligence is doing, the way it actually works, it's, it's aggregating disparate pieces of data to come up with a predictive, pretty accurate, amazingly accurate, that's how your, your, your uh, you know, driverless cars work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm worried about that application in the financial transfer space, right? So you asked the question about what fa Facebook Messenger. You can move money on Facebook Messenger. I can sit and send money to my terrorist buddy over Facebook Messenger. And I made a list of these. If you Google uh, Square Cash, Snap Cash, Snapchat, right? Um, Google Wallet, Vimeo, Vimeo, as my Iraq friends say, lots and lots and lots of these apps. So think about that for a second. We've got this incredibly rigorous, and we haven't even talked about this, the mechanism by which we monitor terrorist transfers of money, even in Hawala. By the way, Hawala, this myth that, oh, it's just this undercurrent. No, they still go through banks, and it's regulated. We can track that. with specific. Now what we've done, and this is an area where I think AI really could help us. I don't understand correctly that fit, and I don't think anybody in the government's really thinking about that problem. I'm really worried about terrorist financing flowing around the border through these, you know, Snap, Snapcat, 
Snapchat, done, gone, boom. Here's your million dollars. So actually the bigger problem on the terrorist financing is not the financial transactions, which are in some level traceable. Even blockchain technology keeps records of things for Bitcoin. But it's actually the overabundance of the $100 bill, right. which is not traceable. Right. Let's have one more question before we uh, call it a session here, which, what a, wow. Thank you, Charlie. Um, I've got an old friend in who's worked in Washington for about 30 years who strongly agrees with the panel. By the way, I'm a journalist, so please don't throw eggs or anything. Um, he said that he thought the Congress of the United States only did two things well, nothing and overreact. <laughs> Given that, um, do we have, through executive order, statutes that we can work with that exist now in the creativity that several of the panelists have talked about in our intelligence community, do we have the capacity right now to deal with this threat until we get the congruence that Professor Newton is talking about? I, I would say on this, the, to me, the biggest challenge to deal with this threat is not the legal authorities, but the lack of qualified personnel. Like the shortage that we have in people with the technical training to be able to do surveillance and cybersecurity work given the magnitude of the threat and the financial incentives for people to go elsewhere than the US government, to me represents a much greater threat than whether or not any particular agency has the authorities or the executive orders that they need. Yeah, so, I mean, this is this sort of a, a, a broad answer. Um, yes, I, right, I, I agree, right, do nothing or, or overreact. In part, that's because um, uh, on a lot of these really important national security questions, which, which are really very complex, um, we've allowed people to just become sort of our ideological proxies. Mm -hmm. Very few people take the time to sit in a conference like this, actually read the primary source of, of statutory text, or, or really sort of understand what, is act, what exactly is going on. And the problem is, is that this is an area that it just doesn't map to, I agree with that person on X issue, so I'm gonna agree on this issue. And so I think what we're seeing now is, um, is a little bit of a realization and an activation that um, we're going to need to engage with this stuff differently, um, and then that citizens are going to have to inform themselves, um, because I, I think there was a, a real disservice in the way sort of the, the Edward Snowden leaks were, were covered by the media. Um, uh, certainly there's been a disservice in, in the lack of information the government has, has brought to the public, right? So, so both sides have, been, have contributed to the problem. Uh, I, I, I think it's what's going to matter in terms of, uh, of going forward now um, is going to be changing that, starting to, to really have um, far more disciplined, specific conversations and, and for a much broader community, not just national security law nerds, but a, a larger group of people to start really caring about, about these issues. I, I'm afraid we'll have to uh, end it there. I got to say, <clears throat> and I'm using the last of my voice to say this, <laughs> I've seen shall I say, more than one panel on surveillance. This is the best panel I have ever seen anywhere. So if you're at Duke Law School and you're taking national security law next year, count on watching uh, the video of this panel. It was absolutely fabulous, and thank you so much. It could not have been done. Thank you so much.